morning we are continuing in Mark's uh, gospel, in Mark 13, which, as you probably are aware by now, is sort of a pared-down version of um, uh, Matthew 24 and 25, which is what we call the Olivet Discourse. Uh, my apologies for those of you who haven't been here through the whole series. We are looking at this passage in a way that most churches do not look at it. I think I've already pointed out that uh, there are those who see it as being entirely future, uh, those who see parts of it in the past and parts of it in the future. Uh, the perspective that we're looking at it is to see it entirely in the past for reasons that I won't be able to go into detail about, but um, uh, hopefully I'll give you enough at least to go on uh, in this. But let's begin by reading the text that we're looking at. And as I've already told you from the beginning of the service, uh, what these things are talking about do not have to be future, but could very easily be past, and that's what I believe them to be. And again, this particular section is the section that most look at and say, well, this means it has to be future. That's the reason why we went through those texts earlier, but we'll look at it a little bit more. Let me read it for you now, beginning in verse 24 through verse 27 of Mark 13. Jesus says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now again, let me just give you a brief recap of what we've seen in Mark chapter 13 from the beginning of the chapter at this point. Uh, we've seen that what Jesus said in this discourse, again called the Olivet Discourse because he was on Mount Olivet when he said it, was directed to a specific audience, to the disciples, in answer to a question that they had regarding when the temple that was then standing was going to be destroyed. Now, Jesus, first of all, gave them things to look for that would happen before the temple was destroyed. He said there would be false Christs, there would be wars and rumors of wars, there would be earthquakes and famines, and the gospel being preached to all nations. And really, very quickly, we also saw historic evidence from eyewitnesses that those very things certainly happened. Uh, every single thing that was mentioned here, and by the way, the gospel being preached to all nations in that time to that audience would simply have meant that the Roman Empire, which was the whole world from their perspective, that everybody there had had a chance to hear the gospel. That's what the book of Acts is all about as Paul goes out and others go out preaching the gospel to every place in the Roman Empire, offering the gospel to the Jew first, when they reject to go to the Gentiles in order that especially all Israel might hear the gospel before judgment comes. The Lord is gathering his sheep together out of the house of Israel. The promise was made to them first. This is their Messiah. This is the fulfillment of all their covenants. They have the right, as it were, given by God to hear these things first. And then after they rejected to go to the Gentiles, but virtually Paul told us the whole world had heard the gospel in his day. So that was fulfilled. He told them secondly, what would signal that it, the destruction of the temple, again, that's the question that Jesus is answering, was imminent or about to happen. And that was the abomination of desolation, which as we saw, remember, is not referring to an image that the Antichrist is going to set up in a temple that hasn't even been built yet, but rather it's referring to the Roman soldiers, the armies of Rome surrounding Jerusalem just before they destroy the city and the temple that was in the city. That's what Daniel 9 is talking about, the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's what the book of Revelation is referring to. Uh, that's what the Olivet Discourse is directed at. We notice the parallel passage in Luke where it replaces the abomination of desolation with the armies surrounding Jerusalem. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that her desolation 
is at hand. Flee to the mountains. Same thing when the abomination of desolation is seen. When you see this, flee to the mountains. In the book of Daniel and Daniel chapter 9, the desolation is referring to the destruction of the city and the temple, which is what Jesus was talking about back then. So, of course, Jesus was warning them because they were going to live to see these things happen. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, get out of the city, get to the mountains because something is going to happen, something that is so bad, no people in the history of the world has had to endure it, nor ever will again. If you don't get out of the city, if you don't get out of the country, you're going to be trapped there and you're going to have to endure it. So Jesus is warning them so that they could escape because what he was speaking of in this passage had to do with them. I mean, Jesus directed it to them. Well, now we come to that part of what Jesus said would happen after the tribulation of those days. And by the way, the tribulation, as we saw, was when Jerusalem was surrounded with all those people trapped inside, under siege for the several, let's say, I think it was like five months Civil war breaking out inside the city. The city divided into three factions. Everybody robbing their neighbor. Killing going on. Of course, plague breaks out. Starvation. People even eating their own children as they're under siege by the Romans for that period of time at the end of a three and a half year war with Rome. What the people of, well, what the Jews experienced within Jerusalem was the worst thing that's happened to anyone. But now we come again to what Jesus said would happen after the tribulation of those days. I've already told you that this section more than any other might tempt us to think that Jesus was speaking about the future. After all, the sun and the moon are darkened, stars fall from the sky, the Son of Man is seen coming on the clouds of heaven, he sends his angels out to gather together his elect. But here we need again to be reminded of the time frames that Jesus gives to us in our text. If we look at verse 30, which takes place, uh, of course, after the text we're looking at, Jesus tells us, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, whatever Jesus is speaking about here had to take place within the lifetime or the lifespan of those that Jesus was speaking these words to. When he says this generation will not pass away, the, the meaning of it is not that this race of people aren't going to pass away, that the Jews will not cease to be a distinct people group, but he says this generation of people living today will not die until everything I have just told you about comes to pass. Actually, more specifically, these things came to pass in 70 AD, as we've seen, that's when the destruction of the temple took place. Jesus says these things will happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. Actually, immediately takes, we see that in Matthew's gospel. Here we see in those days, after that tribulation, this is what's going to happen. Well, that tribulation was, again, the destruction of the holy city. The destruction of the temple. It happened in 70 AD. Whatever Jesus is telling us right here, or what's going to happen here, is going to happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. So again, this generation is not going to pass away until all these things take place. Immediately after that tribulation, when the temple is destroyed, this is what you're going to see happen. So we need to bear those time frames in mind as we consider what it is that Jesus is referring to. Now, this morning, I want us to really see what these three things mean. What does Jesus mean by changes in the heavens? We're going to examine these a little bit more carefully. What he means, secondly, by the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And then thirdly, what he means by the sending of his angels to gather together his elect. Now, first of all, what did Jesus mean by the changes in the heavens where he says, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the heavens. Now, I've already told you that we need to take into account the time frame because Jesus said this would happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. Was there anything like this that happened in conjunction with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD? Well, the answer is yes, 
if we understand what it is that he actually means by this. Now, here's a little bit of, of a lesson in how to understand um, prophecy. Very often in the New Testament in particular, when a vision is given either, uh, well, to actually one of uh, the Lord's uh, messengers, whether a prophet or an apostle, very often the Lord draws upon Old Testament imagery to make his point with language that the audience, the original audience, would be familiar with. Now, we need to understand that this is going to strike them a little bit differently than it would strike us. We need to understand what it would mean to them if we're to understand it properly. Well, what would this mean to them? Well, imagery, as I've already pointed out, was used, imagery of this kind, uh, of, of the darkening of the heavens and so forth, was used many times in the Old Testament to refer to the overthrow of a political power. Now again, we've seen the one example in Isaiah 13. In verse 19 in particular, we read, And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened when God overthrew it? Verse 10, For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light, the sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Now, that sounds very similar to what we read about in Mark 13. As a matter of fact, if you have an NASB, you may have noticed that the words that were used there are in what are called uh, all caps or small caps. Every, every word or every letter is capitalized. And in the NASB, they do that when they see that somebody is quoting an Old Testament scripture. This language is coming out of the Old Testament. Let me give you another example. When in God's judgment against Egypt, in uh, Ezekiel 32, verses 2 through 8, you can either turn that up or just listen to it as I read it. The Lord says to Ezekiel, Son of man, take up a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You compare yourself to a young lion of the nations, yet you are like the monster in the seas. And you burst forth in your rivers and muddied the waters with your feet and fouled their rivers. Thus says the Lord God, now I will spread my net over you with a company of many peoples. And they shall lift you up in my net and I will leave you on the land. I will cast you on the open field and I will cause all the birds of the heavens to dwell on you and I will satisfy the beasts of the whole earth with you. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your refuse. I will also make the land drink the discharge of your blood as far as the mountains and the ravines will be full of you. Now notice, and when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Again, imagery very similar to what we see in Mark 13, very similar to what we saw in Isaiah 13, which was talking about God's judgment on Babylon by the Medes. This is talking about God's judgment against Egypt. Now, there are other examples, but I'm just going to give you those two. Judgment on these nations was accompanied by the darkening of the heavens. Now, were they literally darkened? It's quite possible they were, or it's simply symbolic. God gives light as a blessing to the nations. The sun is a blessing. The stars are a blessing. They, they are for signs and seasons to know the time of the year and so forth, or even for navigation, right? But to darken them is to take that away. To take away light is always a sign of judgment. It's always a sign of curse and not of blessing. Now, when we tie this together with the fact that Israel is often represented by the sun and the moon and the stars, such as it was in the dream that the Lord gave to uh, Joseph. Remember when he related it to his father and his brothers, how they hated him? I had this dream. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars all bowed down to me. And of course, they understood what that meant. Are we going to bow down to you? Well, 
This imagery is used to refer to Israel. And again, in Revelation 12, verse 1, the woman who is clothed with the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars, she is representative of Israel. She, she's representative of the Jews. She's the one in labor who gives birth to the Messiah in, in Revelation 12. So what is the Lord actually saying here? Well, if we take either of these, as far as uh, what happens to Babylon and Egypt and how Israel is represented and the fact that it's being darkened, it has to do with the overthrow of Israel as a political power, as a nation. They're being overthrown. After the tribulation of those days, Jerusalem is going to be overthrown as a political entity. It's no longer going to exist as a nation, and that's exactly what took place after the tribulation of those days when the Romans broke in. They killed many of the Jews and scattered them among the nations. So that is what that imagery, I believe, is referring to. That's exactly what took place in those days. Now, secondly, what did he mean by the Son of Man coming in the clouds? Well, here's a second sign they would see after the tribulation of those days. What does it mean? Well, Jesus had earlier warned his disciples, be careful that no one deceives you. There are going to be many before this happens who are going to come claiming to be the Messiah. We saw that was going to happen before the tribulation and that was going to happen during the tribulation. We've already seen that that is a matter of fact what actually happened before 70 AD and in that siege of Jerusalem what happened in the city. But the way that they knew that it wouldn't be him, that this of course they knew who Jesus Christ was anyway, but that he wasn't appearing perhaps in some other form, that these were actually imposters, is that Jesus was saying that his coming would be clearly seen by everyone. We read in Matthew 24, verse 30. Again, a parallel passage to what we're looking at here. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and, all, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. For those of you who were here last week, as we were looking at the book of Revelation in a nutshell, the same language is used there in Revelation 1-7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Now, I don't know if you remember what we saw in the book of Revelation there, but notice what Jesus is saying here. He's coming with the clouds. Every eye is going to see him. Well, which, what eyes is he referring to here? Even those who pierced him. That's not meant to say that everyone's going to see him, even these people. But in the Greek, it means everyone is going to see him, specifically these people, the ones who pierced him. And it says, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Does that mean that the whole world is going to mourn? Not necessarily, but the tribes. Who are the tribes? If you're talking to Jews about tribes, who's that referring to? It's referring to the 12 tribes of Israel, those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth are going to see him? Not necessarily, but all the tribes of the land of Israel, all the tribes, perhaps all the Jews within the Roman Empire, which is the whole world, they are going to see him. Why are they going to see him? Because they're the ones who pierced him. They are the ones who rejected him. This judgment is against them. And so the Lord wants them to see and know that it is coming from him. This destruction of the temple, this tribulation that brought about the destruction of the city and the temple and and the, the horrible suffering of the Jews inside was to be the proof to those who pierced him that he is, in fact, the Messiah. Now, does this mean that Jesus Christ came back in 70 AD? You know, there are actually people who believe that and who believe that all, you know, all prophecy, all eschatology has already been fulfilled. Well, no, I don't believe that that's what it means, but I think it does mean this, that his coming in the clouds is figurative of his coming in judgment. Again, we saw how in the Old Testament, 
this is the way the Lord represents himself coming to judge a nation as riding on the clouds. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 10, 1, the oracle concerning Egypt, behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the hearts of the Egyptians will melt within them. Actually, that was Isaiah 19, 1. Ezekiel 30, verses 3 through 4, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come upon Egypt and anguish will be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt, they take away her wealth and her foundations are torn down. Notice the day of the Lord will be a day of clouds. When the Lord came to deliver David from King Saul when he was seeking to kill him, he writes in Psalm 18, verses 10 through 12, he rode upon a cherub and flew, and he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the sky. From the brightness before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire fire. So again, judgment against a nation. The Lord comes riding on the clouds. Clouds are used in the imagery. Does this mean that in each of these cases against Egypt, uh, when, when the Lord came to deliver David from Saul, did, did he literally bodily come down in order to deliver him? No. This is just simply figurative language the Lord doesn't literally ride on the clouds, but clouds represent a stormy destruction that is about to come from the hand of the Lord upon those that he is riding out, as it were, to fight against. When Jesus told the high priest and the whole assembly that had gathered together against him and condemned him, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven, what he meant was that they would live to see this judgment executed against them. Again, Jesus says in verse 30 of our passage, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. What Jesus is saying here is that they would live to see his judgment against Jerusalem for their crucifixion of him, their rejection of their Messiah. Uh, John Lightfoot, <clears throat> who was a Jewish scholar who lived at the time of the Westminster Assembly, basically nails it down when he says this. Then shall the Son of Man give a proof of himself whom they would not before acknowledge as proof indeed not in any visible figure, but in vengeance and judgment so visible that all the tribes of the earth shall be forced to acknowledge him, the avenger. The Jews would not know him. Now they shall know him, whether they will or not. Many times they asked of him a sign. Now a sign shall appear that he is the true Messiah, whom they despised derided and crucified, namely, his signal vengeance and fury, such as never any nation felt from the first foundations of the world. So what is this sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds and every eye beholding him except the fact that he brings this judgment against them and this is the evidence that he is in fact the Messiah, the one who is who he claimed to be the one they rejected and murdered. And God's judgment against them is the evidence that he is, in fact, their Messiah. So we've looked at the darkening of the heavens. We've looked at the sign of the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Finally, what does Jesus mean by the sending of the angels to gather his elect from the furthest end of the earth, from the four winds, from the farthest end of heaven? Is, is this the second coming, the raising of the dead, the rapture of the living? Again, there are many who see it's, it's very similar, isn't it, to what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 where 
Jesus descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain are caught up together with the Lord. Because of that, many believe that that's what he has in mind. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. For instance, well, we'll have to ask the question, did the Lord actually rapture his church back in 70 AD? There are people who believe he did. We, we don't agree with them. We think that that event of 1 Thessalonians 4 is still future to us. That's the second coming when Jesus comes this time bodily to the earth. These things that we're reading about here had to happen along with these other signs that we've seen because they're all bundled together with the words immediately after the tribulation of those days and that that generation that was then living would live to see this take place. So what could this mean? Well, I believe that it most likely has to do with the evangelization of the world that began after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That began, of course, even before then, but certainly after then and is continuing to the present day. Now, what about these trumpets? Don't these trumpets indicate that this is the second coming? After all, there are trumpets in the second coming of Christ. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes when we see certain things, certain images in Scripture, like the Son of Man on the clouds and sun, moon, and the stars, and so forth, darkening, we assume that it, all these things have to be referring to one event. Well, they're not necessarily referring to one event, just like the day of the Lord isn't, just like the darkening of the heavens isn't, just like the Lord riding on the clouds isn't. It can refer to several different events. Well. Could this, the fact that there's a trumpet in this event, does it mean it has to be one single event? Well, no. But there's something going on in these different events that contain trumpets that is similar, that they have in common. Now, what is the trumpet supposed to tell us? Well, in the Old Testament again, trumpets have to do with gatherings. When the tribes of Israel were gathered together, it was done through trumpets, Leviticus 23, 24. The Lord said, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Psalmist writes in Psalm 81, verses 3 through 4, blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day, for it is a statute for Israel an ordinance of the God of Jacob. The sounding of the trumpets simply is, a, it is something that was done in Israel to gather people together. The sounding of the trumpets in, in connection with what we're reading about here simply means the Lord is calling his elect to himself. And the way he does that, of course, is through the gospel. The gospel sometimes, I, I believe in scripture, is represented, at least in the Old Testament scriptures, as as the heralding of a message, as a, as a trumpet blowing to gather them together. I think that that's what it means here. Now, what about the angels? The angels who were sent to gather the elect together. Doesn't this refer to the second coming? Because the Lord comes with a host of angels at his second coming. Well, as you probably already know, the word angel in Scripture does not always refer to the spiritual beings that the Lord has created to minister to those who are going to receive the salvation of God, who are going to inherit salvation. The word angel actually refers to one who is sent. That could be an angelic being because they're often sent to minister to us. Or it could refer to somebody who is sent by the church or somebody who is sent by the Lord. It can refer to a man as well as to an angelic being. Uh, for instance, we read in Luke, in Luke 7, 24, when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. Now, the word there, the messengers, they were clearly the ones that John sent to Jesus to ask if he was the expected one or whether we should look for someone else. Jesus said, go back and report to John the things you see and hear, and then he began to tell them what he had done that proved that he was the Messiah. But do you realize that the word that Luke used here for messengers is exactly the same as what we see here in Mark 13? If we were to translate it the same way, it would read this way. 
when the angels of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. These messengers are angels. They are sent ones. It doesn't mean they're angelic beings. It just simply means that they were sent by someone for a specific purpose. So the word angel can refer to a man who is sent or men who are sent to do this work. Now again, this is how John Lightfoot sees this passage. He says this, when Jerusalem shall be reduced to ashes and that wicked nation cut off and rejected, then shall the Son of Man send his ministers with the trumpet of the gospel and they shall gather his elect of the several nations from the four corners of heaven so that God shall not lack a church, although that ancient people of his be rejected and cast off. But that ancient Jewish church being destroyed, a new church shall be called out of the Gentiles. Now again, language that is similar to the second coming is used here because something similar is taking place. After the Lord was going to judge his old covenant church for rejecting his son, he was going to send his ministers into the world armed with the gospel to gather his elect together from all the nations of the earth, all the nations under heaven, to establish a new church, one that is made up of believing Jews and Gentiles. Now again, let me just remind you of a couple of different things. Jesus said that these things were going to happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. The tribulation of those days is clearly referring to what happened to the Jewish people and Jerusalem in 70 AD. Jesus said that generation would not pass away until all these things took place, which means this, this is really the only way I can see these things being fulfilled back in those days. Now, by the way, the mission that he sent his angels to accomplish, to gather his elect from all the nations of the earth, that is the one thing that hasn't yet been completed. It started back then, but it didn't say that it would be completed back then. That's something that's still ongoing. God is still gathering together his people from all the nations under heaven. And this is referring to not just the Roman Empire, but the entire world through his church. And if I were to ask you the question, upon whom does that responsibility fall in the present age? What would you say? Well, obviously, it has to be the Lord's people. It has to be us. Because the Lord has not chosen the angels to gather together his people through the gospel. He has chosen us, those who have come to Christ through the gospel, to do this work. And so here we have the continuing application of this passage to today. The, the, the message is not uh, be ready because tribulation can come any time. The, the rapture is going to take place and you better be ready. Otherwise, you're going to have to go through the tribulation. That's not what this passage is telling you to do. Rather, it is telling you this, that God certainly is faithful to his word. When a, when a people sin against him, he judges them. Uh, God fulfilled exactly what it is that Jesus was predicting. He said this in 30 A.D. It took place in 70 A.D. What he said came to pass. You know how we often take, we want to prove to somebody the Bible is the word of God, and we, you know, we look at the Old Testament scriptures that prophesy certain things are going to take place, and we look at their fulfillment in the New Testament, and we say, you know, who can predict the future except God alone? Well, we can do exactly the same thing here. This is what Jesus said would happen. This is exactly what happened. We can use this in our arsenal okay, of proofs that the Bible is the word of God. But the second thing it tells us is because the work of gathering together God's elect is not yet complete, we still have work to do. We need still to give ourselves to the work of evangelism. You gotta remember that God saved you, not just so you could be a trophy of his grace. If that's all he wanted to do, when you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he could have just beamed you right up, and that would be the end of it. But he left you here to do a particular work, and that is to get that gospel to others so that 
they too can be saved, that they too can escape God's judgment for their sins and be able to uh, enter into heaven at last through that final judgment through Jesus Christ, who is the only way. It is our task to get that gospel out to others. We are the means by which God does this. And by the way, this is not a, a burden to us. We shouldn't say, you know, what a bummer. I've got to do some work for Jesus. Uh, after all, he saved me from hell. He's given me a place in heaven. But I really would rather just have fun. You know, I really don't want to do work. It shouldn't be a bummer to us. But it's the greatest privilege that anyone could ever possibly have to be enlisted by Jesus Christ, to do his work, and even to suffer for him. That is the greatest privilege that anybody could possibly have. And I hope if you've ever had that experience, and I hope you have, of, of just doing something that you know that the Lord used you for, and even if you had to suffer for it, to be able to say, you know what, I am so thankful that the Lord chose me to do that. Even though I, I'm smarting because of it, even though you know, I, something's happened to me that wasn't pleasurable, I didn't have fun, you know, the way that we think about fun, but yet I stood in his place, I took some abuse that was meant for him. The Lord actually did something that means something through me. What a tra great privilege to be able to do that. But, but that's the privilege that the Lord has actually given to you. It's not a bummer, but it's a great blessing that he has entrusted. So realizing that's the case, we should do the very best we can to, to glorify him in this way, to advance the kingdom of heaven. Again, there's many ways we can do it. We've been looking at several different ways through our prayers and through our labors and through our giving. There's, there's a variety of ways we invest in the kingdom of heaven, but there can be no greater privilege than serving the Lord, and there isn't. And we'll see that fully when we stand before him on the day of judgment and know that by his grace we, we are able to do something uh, that he was able to use to bring glory to his name because that's all that's going to matter on that day. That's the only thing. Not how much fun we had in the world, not how much of the world's treasures uh, we had or how much of the world's glory we had. That'll mean absolutely nothing. All that will matter is how much glory we've given to him, how much we've honored him and been used by him to advance the kingdom of heaven. That is what he has given us to do. That is a great privilege, and that is all that matters. Now, if you don't, let me just say in closing, if you don't know the Lord this morning, we do need to remember that this is the day of his grace. Uh, this is the time that the Lord is gathering together his people out of the world to keep them safe from judgment. Uh, there is a judgment coming. And if you want to be safe from that judgment, you do need to come to Jesus Christ. You do need to trust him. You do need to turn away from your sins. And you do need to follow him. It's only those who actually follow the Lord and serve him who are really his children. And if you haven't done that, I would encourage you to do that now while the day of opportunity is here. May God give you the grace to do exactly that. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, to apply what we've just seen in a way that we need to hear it.